morning. In the book of Genesis, the uh, 18th chapter. Genesis, the 18th chapter, we find Abraham and his nephew Lot. They have parted ways because their herdsmen could not get along because there wasn't enough room for them, so they were fighting amongst themselves. So they split up and Abraham allows Lot to choose where he wants to go. And Abraham says, if you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. So Lot chooses to go to Sodom because it was well watered and it just, it just looked good. The grass looked greener over there than where he was at, so he chose to go to Sodom. And we all know that he got in a terrible mess. By the time it was over, the angels would have to grab him and his family by the hand and pull them out of Sodom and the sin that was going on there. So we know his righteous soul was vexed. But it's not so much Lot that I want to talk about or that we talked about Sunday morning even. As it is Abraham and his intercession for his nephew. When Abraham heard that God was fixing to send some angels down there to see what kind of shape Sodom was in and to see if Sodom was actually as bad off. And of course, God knew this. But God's ever merciful. Amen. Instead of just wiping it off, He decides He'll give them a second, you know, a second look and sends his, going to send His men down there. And then Abraham knows what's coming next because Abraham knows that God punishes sin. There's always been penalties that came with sin. If you're under the blood and with your faith in the finished work of the cross tonight, that penalty was laid upon Jesus. But if, you're, if you haven't accepted Him, if you don't have your faith in the finished work of the cross tonight, that penalty still awaits you. But Abraham knew that God's judgment was getting ready to be poured out on Sodom. So what does he do? Does he go back to his tent like many times us Christians of today do? And, you know, we go do our religious duty. Most of the time that's what it is. Religious duty. And we go back to our homes and we care about our, our everyday lives, not giving any much thought to the lost souls that might go out of here today, that might lose their life today, that might die unsaved. But Abraham's not willing to do that. After the angels go, he sticks around to talk to God. And he begins to intercede on behalf of his nephew. The Bible says in Genesis 18 and 20, and the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is coming to me. And if not, I will know. And the men, these are the men, the angels that had been talking there with Abraham, turned their faces and went, and went from thence and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Abraham stays behind to talk to God. He doesn't go back to his tent and mind his own business and act like everything's just fine. Well, somebody else will take care of Lot. Well, Lot's got what's coming. That's, a, that's something our flesh likes to say. Well, they're going to get what's coming to them. Thank God today that none of us have gotten what is coming to us. Amen. Amen. None of us deserve forgiveness today. Somehow we get on a, on a pedestal and we think, well, we deserve it more than they do. Or they got their self in that mess. They deserve what they get. Well, all of us deserve something. Amen? Many of us today deserve something that we didn't get because of the mercy and the grace of God. So thank God for His mercy and for His grace. We don't get what we deserve because of His mercy. So Abraham, instead of leaving this in the hands of chance, he decides to stick around and talk to God. And listen to what he says. Verse 24. Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. For he says that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Talking to the Lord. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So he's pleading with God. He's talking to Him. He says, if there's 50 righteous, will you spare the city? And the Lord answers him and says, Yes, Abraham, if there's 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. 
Then he says in verse 27, Abraham said, answered and said, Behold now, I have taken it upon me, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Now that's what we talked about Sunday morning. How that Abraham had took it upon himself to pray for Lot. I told you this Sunday morning, I'll tell you this tonight. I don't belittle the leading of the Spirit whatsoever. We need the leading of the Spirit. We have to have the leading of the Spirit. But many times we use that as a crutch. Many times we say, well, I don't do that because I don't feel led to do that. I would do a certain thing, but I don't feel led to do that certain thing. Instead of seeing the need and deciding that, hey, maybe there's something we can do to help, something we can do to, to help the need or to help the person that's in need, or maybe to pray for somebody, we wait till we feel led. God doesn't always draft people. Sometimes He looks for volunteers. And Abraham volunteered his time, his energy, his effort, out there on the hillside to pray for Lot when Lot couldn't apparently pray for himself. He's out there on the hillside pleading for Lot's and his family's life. Why? Because he felt a big move in the Spirit. Because he heard thunder. Because he saw lightning fall from the sky. No, because he took it upon himself to pray for somebody. God could use some people today that will take it upon themselves to pray for somebody. We do a lot of time, we spend a lot of time praying for ourselves. I wonder how much time we spend praying for everybody else. Abraham's not out here pleading for something that's for his benefit. He's out here praying for something for Lot, for Lot's benefit, for his family. Because he knows that judgment is coming. And he says, Lord, I've taken it upon myself to talk to you. I've taken it upon myself. Simple, yes, but a big thing that the church has missed out on today. We've dismissed prayer and intercession for others. We don't pray, Lord, let me have a burden for somebody. We don't pray, Lord, send something for me to do. Most of the time we try to get out of doing whatever we can get out of doing. But Abraham took it upon himself to pray for Lot. It would behoove us all today that if we would that we would take it upon ourselves to do some things for the Lord. And quit sitting around waiting for the Spirit to move us to do it. Unless God tells you not to do it, if there's a need to be met, do what you can to help. That's what Abraham did. Abraham didn't wait until he heard. He could have sat around there and wait till he was led of the Spirit to pray for Lot, and it might have been too late. Might have been too late for Lot. You see, some people don't have time. For you to, their, their clock is running out. Some people don't have time to wait until Brother Tommy feels led to pray for them. Some people don't have time left for you to decide to him haul around until finally you feel moved to the Spirit to do something. No, we're running out of time. Some people more than others. And Abraham took it upon himself. That's what we need to do. We need to take it upon ourselves to pray. Take it upon yourself to pray for this church. Take it upon yourself to pray for your family. Take it upon yourself to pray for your children. Take it upon yourself to pray for your friends, for your neighbors. All of us have neighbors that are lost and don't know Jesus. We should be praying for those neighbors. We shouldn't just say, how do you do, just walk on by. We should be praying for them. <clears throat> they should be in our prayers. This nation should be in our prayers. But I wonder how much time any of us spent today praying for America, the shape that she's in, and the fact that she's in bad, bad condition. It's time that the church took it upon herself to do something other than, oh, we take it upon ourselves to do things. We need to build, build a bigger building. We need to have fancier ministry headquarters. We need to find new ways to keep people excited. If I have to find something to keep you excited, if Jesus ain't enough, go find somewhere else to go. Because I can't help you. Because that's what I have to offer is Jesus. Abraham took it upon himself to pray for Lot. And I mentioned Nehemiah Sunday morning. This is really what I want to share with you tonight. All of that's just pretty much rehashing what we said Sunday morning. Of course, some of you weren't here Sunday morning. Turn with me to the book of Nehemiah, the first chapter. Nehemiah, the first chapter. 
I'm going to read a few verses there, not very many. Nehemiah, the first chapter, and beginning in the first verse. Here we find another man. We don't find a great move of God that fell upon him. We don't find the Spirit moving on him in a great way and him falling on his face and hearing a word from heaven on what to do. We see a man who sees a need and decides to do something about it instead of waiting around for someone else to do it. Nehemiah, the first chapter, beginning the first verse. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. And it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the twentieth year, as I was at Shushan the palace, almost like speaking in tongues, eh? that Hanai, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Now listen. All he does is ask them, what about the Jewish people? What kind of condition are they in? What about the city? What about Jerusalem? How are things over there? And the report that he got was not a good one. It says, They said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there, the province, are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down. You see, that was a big thing in their day. The wall was broken down. The gates thereof had been burned with fire. So they had no defense whatsoever. If somebody wanted to attack them, they could attack them. No wall. No gates. No defense. And they were in great affliction. And it came to pass when I heard these words... Nehemiah said that I decided, well, that sounds pretty bad, but I'm real busy. I've got some other things to do today. I've got to go and take care of this business over here. I don't have time for that. Maybe later I'll have time. That's not what the book of Nehemiah says, is it? If you've got it over there, unless you've got some kind of new famous version that I don't. The Word of God says that Nehemiah, when he had heard these things, he sat down and he wept and mourned for certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Here we find another man that took it upon himself to do something about the condition of God's people. It didn't affect him any. He could have went right along with his life. He was along the chain of command there. He was one of the servants of the king. He had some authority. He had some, at least some province in, in standing there in the, in the community. He could have continued his life as usual. He could have went along as normal. Abraham had better things to do than to be out there on the hillside on his knees calling out to God on, the, on behalf of backslidden Lot. But he took it upon him. You can always find something better to do. That's what tickles me about people saying, well, I'll be in church unless something happens. Well, something always going to happen. You'll always find, there'll always be something else you could be doing other than coming to church. There'll always, there'll always be somewhere else you can put your money other than the work of God. There's always something else and the devil makes sure of that. Nehemiah doesn't wait until the time is right. <laughs> Nehemiah doesn't wait until God speaks to him through a fire or through a cloud. Nehemiah takes it upon himself to begin praying for the people of God. And when he goes before the king in the second chapter, the king notices how his countenance is not the same. He, he looks different. And the king begins to question him. What's wrong with you? I can tell you're burdened down. And the Bible says the king said to him in chapter 2 verse 4, For what doest thou make request? What is it that you want? What is it I can do for you? And Nehemiah says, So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said unto the king, Now what have you been praying about? What is it that he's prayed certain days over? Why has he been fasting? Has he been fasting for himself? Has he been fasting for and praying for the things that he needs? No, we find out here, he's been fasting and praying for God's people because he heard of what bad shape they were in. He took it upon himself to begin to fast and pray for those that were in trouble. Oh, we could use some of that today. He tells the king, if it please the king, 
and if thy servant hath found favor in thy sight. Give me a promotion? I didn't want he said. Raise my pay. I wonder if we spend more time praying for a raise than we do praying for the lost. Do we spend more time praying for a promotion than we do for the lost? Do we spend more time praying for a new house or a new car or new clothes than we do the lost? If we do, our priorities are messed up. This is what he says. If it pleased the... Now listen, the king is asking, what is it that you want me to do for you? That lays out a whole array of things he could have asked for. But he said, if it pleased the king and if thy servant had found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. Oh, that, that's wonderful. The burden of Nehemiah. The burden of Abraham that he had for Lot. The burden of Nehemiah that he had for God's people in the city of Jerusalem. We could use a burden today, but we don't have time. We're too busy. We barely have time for God at all, much less have a burden for somebody. A burden for the lost, a burden for our nation, a burden for the church. We could all take a lesson from this to take it upon ourselves to pray for those that we know that are lost. Take it upon ourselves to be concerned about somebody besides just us. Take it upon ourselves to spend some time in prayer, at least as much in time of time in prayer for the lost as we do for other frivolous things that are going to burn anyway, that are going to pass away anyway. Every one of us, every day, should pray for lost souls. Every one of us should pray, Lord, let me be a light to somebody. We should take it upon our, not wait till we feel led to, not wait till we're moved upon by the Spirit. And like I said, I'm not belittling the moving and the leading of the Spirit. We all need that. But there are times I believe God allows things to cross our path and brings things to our attention just to see what kind of reaction we'll have without Him having to stick His thumb in our back and shoving us into the situation to do something about it. Somebody that's in need. Somebody that needs prayer. Somebody that needs a helping hand. Somebody that needs a hug, Brother Isaac. Somebody that needs something. We should take it upon ourselves to be that person that helps. You'll find this all throughout the Word of God. Men and women that stood up, squared their shoulders, and without any big cataclysmic uh, spiritual event at all, and said, I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to do something for God. If we had that today, the church would be in a whole lot better shape than she's in. Amen. We need people that will take it upon themselves to pray for others, mm -hmm. to help others, to meet the needs of others, to care about others. That's what Jesus did. What did Jesus do? He laid down His royalty and His glory. Why? Because He took it upon Himself. He said, I lay down my life. No man takes it from me. He took it upon Himself to be the sacrifice to save a lost and dying world. He took it upon Himself to lay aside His needs and His wants so that He could save you. And really, when you get down to where the rubber meets the road, that is an important part of being a Christian. Having compassion and mercy. You see, we're not like the Muslims. We don't holler death to the infidels that don't believe the way we do. That's not what our book says. You know, our book doesn't say hate those and kill those. Jesus said pray for those that despitefully use you. Jesus said to love your enemies. To do good to those that do evil to you. That's all a part of being a Christian. I got a letter this week from someone and they, it was a big, big long letter and they wrote about how this person had done them wrong. How that they had lied to them, they had cheated them, they had swindled them out of all this money. And they wanted me to give them some scriptures to let them know that they were okay and that, in, that they weren't in the wrong in helping this person. And Of course I did send them the Bible says be not weary in well doing. If someone deceives you into helping them, your good deed does not go unrewarded. Of course they'll reap what they sow too. But more than anything, I want it because you could tell by the, just the tone of his writing, I know that sounds strange, but the way he worded his letter, that he was having trouble forgiving. 
That's the most dangerous thing in the whole thing. Is not being able to forgive others. Amen? That's a great part of being a Christian. So much so that Jesus said, if you can't forgive me and their trespasses, your Father in Heaven can't see you tie His hands. You block forgiveness for yourself when you can't forgive others. We must find it within ourselves. And if you can't, pray. Say, God, please help me to forgive them. Take it upon yourself this week to pray for your enemy. Take it upon yourself this How many people in here know somebody that just rubs you completely the wrong way and you almost, if you were honest, you would say you can't stand them. Take it upon yourself this week to pray for that person. See what God does. I don't want you to give me no names because I'm... But all of us have somebody that it's hard for us to pray for. Yeah. Take it upon yourself this week to pray. It's easy for me to pray for those that I see in here tonight. Yeah. I love all y'all. Y'all love, love me. Y'all probably love me more than I love y'all. No. But it's easy to pray for those that you love. Let's take it upon ourselves to pray for some of them people that we find it hard to love. You know why? Because some people find it hard to love you. Amen? All of us are flesh. All of us are made out of the same dirt. And think about it for a minute. If God waited till we deserved it to forgive us, every one of us would be lost and undone because none of us deserve it. Take it upon yourself to pray for others. Take it upon yourself to carry the burden. Do you remember the man that was lame and they, Jesus was in the house and it was packed and there was no way to get to Him? Do you remember what happened with that? There were some men that took it upon themselves to carry that diseased man not just to the house but up on top of the roof. They tore the roof off and let Him down in the middle of the crowd. Why? Was it beneficial to them? No. But they took it upon themselves to help somebody. They took it upon themselves to have a burden for somebody else. Behoove us all tonight to look at that scripture real long and real hard and decide that we too will be one of those that take it upon ourselves to do something for somebody. Somebody else have something tonight.